Conservative Book Club members, thank you for listening to our weekly author interview podcast series. I'm Chris Malagisi, editor of the Conservative Book Club. Today, our feature author interview is with someone whom you most likely have either read his weekly column or previous best-selling books. Our feature author is not only an author, but a lawyer, nationally syndicated columnist, political commentator, served in the National Guard, and is author of six New York Times bestsellers, including Jesus on Trial, Crimes Against Liberty, and The Great Destroyer. If you haven't read his books or columns, you've probably seen him then on Fox News, CNN, The Blaze, CBN, and, and even CNBC. He's also been a guest on national radio shows, including Sean Hannity, Mark Levin, Laura Ingram, Glenn Beck, and Salem's own Michael Medved, Dennis Prager, and The Mike Gallagher Show. But throughout his career, our author has been an articulate and detail-oriented author, approaching all his books in his judicious manner, making the case for or against a certain topic. Uh, but really, he's carved out an interesting niche for himself with his um, this book that just came out and his previous book, Jesus on Trial, which tells about his personal journey from skeptic to Christian, using the evidence from Scripture to prove Jesus really was the Son of God. If you haven't figured it out yet, our feature guest today is David Limbaugh, author of the newly released book, The Emmaus Code, Finding Jesus in the Old Testament, a wonderful follow-up to Jesus on Trial. David, it's an absolute pleasure having you here today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us about your new book, The Emmaus Code. And I guess the the first question we need to ask for those who are unfamiliar with the title is, what exactly is The Emmaus Code? Well, Jesus uh, met two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jer Jerusalem, they think, in one of his resurrection appearances. And they were despondent because... Jesus had died on the cross, and he had not delivered a political victory for Israel, and for all they knew, all his work was in vain, and they were talking about the fact that he had died and was buried and all that. Mm -hmm. And so he starts walking along with him, and they don't recognize him. In fact, the, the text says they were made not to recognize him, which is interesting. And eventually he integrates into the conversation, and he explains to them who he is, and he opens up the scriptures to them. Keep in mind the scriptures at that time were exclusively the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And he shows them how the entire Old Testament is centered in him and points to him. So uh, to me, it, is a, it was a great epiphany from them, for them. It is a great epiphany for us because, you see, God superintends all of scripture, I believe, as scripture states, that it's divinely inspired. Therefore, God included... Uh, everything in this Bible that he intended for us to take as relevant. So this story is relevant. So Jesus didn't just open up the scriptures to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. By recording it in the Bible narrative, he's opening it up for us. And so through the New Testament, which of course was later written uh, under the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we have a good idea of what Jesus might have told these disciples and how he, uh, what he might have said to them of how, how the Old Testament scriptures pointed to him through yeah. uh, typology, prophecy, various other things that we can get into. And I just think it is, it is totally uh, fascinating. And, and, and so I wanted to dedicate this book to demonstrating how the Old Testament points to Christ. It is Christ-centered. It's counterintuitive because we don't think of that. And people also uh, tend to underappreciate the Old Testament thinking it's full of arcane stories and difficult genealogies. What they have to realize is that the Old Testament is just as much a part of the Bible as the New Testament. It is foundational to the New Testament. It, it opens up our understanding uh, to the New Testament. It prepares us for the gospel. It shows us our need for salvation. And it explains, it, it, it lays it all out in an integrated whole uh, with the New Testament. So my, my point, my purpose in this book is kind of twofold. It is to present a, an Old Testament primer um, and to show how Christ is integral to every part, every, every detail, every syllable of the Old Testament, at least indirectly. And, and I, I began this project 20 years ago I, I was so into the, the way I got into the Bible was uh, through studying the Old Testament, and I was exposed to the Christ-centeredness of it, 
And I started writing a book 20 years ago, and it just wasn't the right time. So this is kind mm-hmm. of a fulfillment of a dream for me. And uh, so that's what it is. It's, it's something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Well, I, I think you hit on a great point, because I think a lot of Christians have heard that you know the Old Testament doesn't necessarily matter. It's really about the New Testament and, and the teachings of Jesus. And I, I think you've just nailed it on, on being able to, in your book, you call the Old Testament the first act of, uh, of God's plan for humankind's re- uh, redemption. And I, I think you just nailed it. Um, you, you also go to great length in the book describing numerous examples of how the Old Testament is linked to the New Testament. Other than the Emmaus story, and without obviously giving, giving all, everything away from your book, what, what are some of the most profound examples tying the Old Testament to the New Testament together? Well, th- there, are, there are so many different threads that, and, and I, I, by the way, I, I really... I was having studied this for a long time, and, and, and I was excited about this project. And then, because when you talk about the Emmaus Code, it is the code that unlocks the Emmaus Road experience, which unlocks the Old Testament, which ultimately un- unlocks uh, Scripture itself. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was like, it wasn't my idea to come up with that name, Emmaus Code, but I think it's cool, kind of a you know, oh, yeah. a play, play of the. Uh, uh, you know, the other books that are out there, and I just think it's cool. So but the various threads, the Christ-appointing threads, are, for example, prophecy, typology, where certain events in the Old Testament are uh, point to events in the New Testament which are fulfilled in Christ, biblical covenants, there are a series of covenants uh, that God makes with Israel that, have, that find their uh, immediate fulfillment in his dealings with Israel in Old Testament times, but, but find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And, and, and all these, uh, these covenants are interrelated so that you have the uh, Edenic covenant, the, the Adamic covenant, with, and I could go into that, we don't have time in this, but the Abrahamic covenant where God uh, promises uh, Abraham that he will bless him and bless all nations through him. And so we have a thread, a, a redemptive thread, all through the Bible, and let me, that ultimately culminates in Jesus Christ dying for our sins and providing us a way to salvation if we will, we will appropriate his finished work on the cross. I find this fascinating in Genesis, Genesis 3.15. The very time that God administers judgment against human beings for their fall, for Adam and Eve's fall uh, and their sin, and eating of the apple. The very time he administers judgment, he also makes his first announcement of the gospel mm-hmm. because he tells he tells them in uh, Genesis three fifteen that he's going to that Satan will bruise uh, Jesus uh, Christ's head, but, but ultimately Christ will uh, will end sin. He will defeat Satan and the devil, uh, and see, he defeat sin and Satan. And it is just, it is, it's mind-blowing to me uh, how it all works. Well, by the way, when I first uh, was exposed to biblical prophecy, messianic prophecy, I, and I, I saw some of this stuff, and I wasn't as firm a believer as I am now when I was just beginning. And I said, you guys uh, who, who claim that these are messianic prophecies, some of these, you're really stretching it. And I, I, so I, let me give you this Genesis 3.15 and mm-hmm. explain what I'm talking about. It says, that this is God, it, he's talking to the serpent, uh, after he had administered punishment on Adam and Eve, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now this gives me goosebumps when I think about it. I first thought, well, what are you talking That's not a messianic prophecy. Well, not only is it a messianic prophecy, it is a proto-evangelum, or they call it. It's the first announcement of the gospel. Because when he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her, Jesus was the offspring of a woman, not of a man. He is the product huh. of, of Mary and the Holy Spirit. So th- that gives me goosebumps. The woman. Every, every human being is the product of a, is the offspring of a woman, but only Jesus is only the product of a woman. Mm-hmm. So that's what that means. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head. Now notice, he shall bruise your head. He's going to damage Christ. Christ actually died, but then he triumphed over sin because he said, no, no, excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry. 
he, you shall bruise his heel. The heel's insignificant, but but then Jesus, he, which we now know is talking about, he, he shall bruise your head. The head is a, if you hurt somebody's head, it's going to be lethal. Yeah. Jesus voluntarily went to the cross for our sins. He allows Satan to injure his heel. But by, by uh, in the very process of being injured, he kills Satan by triumphing over sin and death. And that's the first announcement. And, and that, that, that announcement of the gospel in 315, right there at the mm-hmm. beginning, uh, is carried through to the, to the Abrahamic covenant where God promises Abraham he will, in, in Genesis 12, that he, which is nine chapters later, that he will uh, bless him and he'll bless all nations through him, uh, among other things in the covenant. And then that's, notice all these covenants are made with Israel, the nation of mm-hmm. Israel, because he founded the nation of Israel uh, from Abraham. And so he's, he's going to bless Abraham and all those through him. Ultimately, the way he blesses people through Abraham and his offspring is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you have, you have all these covenants that find their fruition and culmination in Jesus. And so I show those threads. Uh, of the covenants all the way through, and that that's another uh, way it points to Christ. So you've got you've got the typology, uh, you've got the prophecy, the biblical covenants, the titles of for Christ that we believe are used pointing to Him in the Old Testament. Christophanies, which are appearances uh, uh-huh. of Christ, pre are incarnate appearances. That is, He appeared as a human being before. Uh, the New Testament times, before he actually was born as an actual human being, he appeared in Old Testament times mostly as an angel of the Lord. Scholars, conservative scholars, believe that was actually Jesus uh, in those Christophanies. Their theophanies is the, is the word, but any time that when God appears to man, but when it's Christ doing, it's called a Christophany. So all these appearances. Then there's all kinds of prefigurings and portraits of Christ uh, in the Old Testament that point to the New. Okay. There's, there's uh, you know, the theological things that, that, that tie the two things together. So it, it's, it's, it's per- the, the evidence is abundant in here. And I think when people read this, they will be shocked at just how Christ-centered the Old Testament is in ways that they never even imagine. Oh, I, I think I agree. They definitely will. I it, Speaking about that, um, your message to people reading this, I, I guess, I, if I can preface this, uh, just in awe of your own personal journey from skeptic to Christian, and you go into that in great detail in uh, your book, uh, Mayus Code and wow. Jesus on Trial, I, I'm curious, can you tell us a little bit about your personal Christian journey, and what message do you have for, for other skeptics out there who aren't fully sold on Christianity? I uh, began as someone who believed in God but did not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, and I flirted with deism and all different kinds of uh, philosophical and uh, thought. And and I, I just the, the truth was I hadn't really given the Bible a chance. And once I began to study it, and, and various people witnessed to me and saw how the the Old Testament, and this is the truth. And this is why, by the way, why I'm excited about this Emmaus Code, something I should have mentioned before. This Emmaus Code experience reflects my own personal experience. That mm-hmm. is, I became really a believer uh, through the Old Testament because uh, I was shown how the Old Testament is so integrally tied to the New, and then I was shown the Messianic prophecies, I was shown a reference Bible where all these different things interrelate, and then I also began to study apologetics, the, the proofs, the evidence for the, the truth of Christianity. And so, after studying it, I became convinced that there is overwhelming evidence pointing to uh, the validity of Christianity's truth claims. And even if I had certain intellectual or emotional doubts, I could no longer deny the overwhelming nature of the evidence. And, and so I eventually then placed my faith in Christ. But it was, it was, it was you know, it was kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and I guess there's one more question here. I, you know, you talk about in your book how um, we need to have a reset of our broken moral compass as a nation. And, you know, I just read an interesting study that came out not too long ago about how our society is becoming more secular, but at the same time, we're also becoming more religious, too. At the same, it's this interesting phenomenon that's going on. But um, obviously, with things in Ferguson and Baltimore and, and our, it seems our culture is in such a mess right now. 
Um, how how could this message help do what you suggest to do? Reset that broken moral compass. Well, I think in these last seven eight years, we've seen an acceleration of the moral decline of our nation. We've seen it occurring for the last fifty years or more, but it is it's gone into hyperspeed now, and secular militant secular forces are aggressively trying to uh, subordinate Christianity and I think assault our religious liberties and actually relegate us to an inferior status uh, and that of course strikes some as absurd uh, but the people that are behind it know what they're doing and we are currently losing we're seeing uh, a loss of our religious liberties in various respects we saw the, a football coach the other day who couldn't even voluntarily play yeah, yeah. on the 50 yard line we saw a football player hold up his finger in exaltation after he scored a touchdown and he was suspended from school i think because he was pointing to god this is an outrageous spiritual war on god it makes a uh, spiritual war between evil forces in my view and, and forces of truth, and that may sound weird, but I can't explain it on human terms because it is just too bizarre. What these people are doing is so indefensible. For trying to force transgender uh, people into bathrooms, public bathrooms uh, designated for the other sex, that is so outrageously, objectively ridiculous, and yet we're having to talk about it because we've got people now. Now, when the city of Houston voted against it, then we've got this, these forces threatening to sue them. You talk about aggressive, and they say they don't want to trample on our rights. Do you want your uh, kids to go in a bathroom with some predator masquerading as someone yep. who is not who is a different gender? That shouldn't even be discussed. It's so ridiculous. So my point is, all these things are, are uh, coming to a head. They're accelerating. Our values are on the line. Uh, and we have to, to defend ourselves, and, and, and I don't mean in a militant way. We have to start, quit, we have to quit being apologetic for what we believe. We have to quit cowering from, from public, the public square. And, and I think we need to, to turn to what is most important in life, and those things are spiritual. So as important as our political is, sometimes we can only find solace in, in the spiritual. And I want to encourage people to, to go to that well, that well is Jesus Christ, and and find that's where we find our ultimate hope. But and that's part of the reason for this book. But but the real reason is I want I want people to I want people's faith to be strengthened by a greater appreciation for the Old Testament and for the entire Bible, and to understand that Christ is the focus of all of it. And I hope that by imparting that and, and by people agreeing with it, if they do, that it will enhance their faith like it has mine. Oh, David, it's a wonderful message, wonderful message, and we wish you the best of luck. Just one last thing. When you're not writing your column, best-selling books are appearing on TV and radio, what does David Limbaugh do for fun? Well, I, got, I have five kids, so I have a lot to keep me busy. <laughs> and I also practice law here and there, so... Uh, you know, it's it's a busy life, but it's very fulfilling, and and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And but you know, I, I have some friends that you know you can think everything's going great and you're blessed, and and you have to thank God for your blessings. But things can turn on a dime. I've had tragic things happen to some close friends, and 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 so whatever you have in the material world can be taken from you just in an instant. And so that's another reason, and I don't mean to be negative here, the ultimate message is positive. Mm -hmm. We have to remember to, to abide in Christ, to be close to God, uh, and to put our faith in Him, because ultimately, uh, that's where we're headed anyway. It's all about, it's all about Christ and, and, and being in Him and having faith in Him. And, and hopefully the rest of the rest of the things will be uh, you'll you'll be able to uh, view the rest of life in the proper perspective if you keep Christ centered. And David, I, I I think it's a again it's a wonderful message, and I I tell some people too when I. Uh, you know, when people are talking about their faith and, and they, they have a lot of questions, you know, I ask them, hey, have you ever tried reading the New Testament? Have you ever tried just uh, reading at least the four Gospels and start there? And I think your book and companion with it is um, both this and Jesus on Trial are just, they're wonderful books and you have a wonderful message. And we really wish you the best of luck and thank you for taking the time today to talk with us. It's an honor. Uh to experiment with you and, and uh, on my interviews and s screw things up so I can come back and do it better <laughs> the next time. <laughs> no, it really is an honor for you 
to, to be able to uh, to do this, and I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Uh, we appreciate it. Well, CBC members, make sure to check out conservativebookclub.com to learn more about David Limbaugh and his new book, The Emmaus Code, Finding Jesus in the Old Testament. And make sure to also check out our recent author podcast interviews with Fox News' Brian Kilmeade and James Rosen. Thank you again, David, for taking the time today. No, no, do not promote Kilmeade and Rosen's book. That is a no, no. <laughs> Only if you have extra money. Do you talk? Kurt, don't tell Kimmy that. I'm, I know you're going to have me on the show. <laughs> Only tell him I slammed him after he had me on the show. <laughs> I, I will tell him. Just talk to this producer today. Uh, well, David, thank you again very much. We wish you all the best of luck. Thank you, sir. Very all much. All right. Thanks Bye. again, David.